This week on Q&A, actor and activist Sonia Son, founder and CEO of Rewired for Change, a nonprofit group working with at-risk children in Baltimore, Maryland. Sonia Son, when did you first think about becoming an actress? Wow. Um, you know, I, uh, I did not recall ever wanting to be an actress when I first started studying and I found acting until um, just before my mother passed away. Uh, she presented, um, she presented my husband uh, with a, uh, a little piece of paper um, that I had uh, typewritten um, uh, the story of what I want to be uh, when I was 10 years old. And uh, that Christmas, my husband gave me this piece of paper along with some childhood photos. And lo and behold, in the middle of that, <laughs> you know, little um, story, um, I stated that I wanted to be a movie star. I had no recollection of ever wanting to pursue acting. As a matter of fact, um, when it was first suggested to me um, when I was in my 20s and uh, um, on uh, the poetry scene in New York, I was completely appalled by the idea. Um, you know, there had been some suggestions, you know, just folks, you know, in passing would say, oh, you should do print modeling, you know, you, you should be an actress. And I, just, I thought it was the most vain profession that um, anyone could get into, and it was very ego driven, and I was, you know, quite <laughs> opposed to um, anything of that nature, you know, in terms of career anyway. Um, so uh, I had always thought that the story was I never wanted to be an actress, and this profession just kept knocking me um, in the back of the head, and eventually I felt I had to turn around <laughs> and face it. What was your first acting job? My first acting job was um, a, a small um, independent film titled uh, Work. Uh, Rachel Reichman was the director. Um, very few people have seen that film because at the time I didn't consider myself an actress. I was a uh, spoken word artist. I was um, I had gone back to school. I was uh, pursuing a degree um, in English and had planned on teaching English in a inner city high school and, and writing writing a novel. Um, that was the track that I was on. But um, there was a uh, there was a a uh, fellow by the name of Greg Tate. He was a, a film and music critic for the Village Voice at the time, and he was a friend of mine who had seen me um, on stage quite a bit. And had uh, he, he thought that I should actually I should um, I should audition for this role. And the way he got me to do it was um, simply just he, he simply told me that the that the role called for someone with an athletic build. Um, the character was you know a, a track star in high school and I thought and I played sports in high school and he just thought yeah you should just you know just go out for it you know he was someone I respected so I thought ah well, you know what harm does it do you know and I ended up with the role and so I thought I'd just try it I have a sort of adventurous nature and I thought um, I'll try anything once um, it was a six-week shoot um, how you know how how many times in your life is someone going to ask you to be in a film? So I thought, hey, let's just do it for fun. What year was that? That was 90, oof, let me see, Slam came out in 98, we shot it in 97. Um, it had to be probably the, probably five years before, I studied for five years, 92. It probably was 91, 92, I would say. Um, because just after that, I, I, the director, um, thought that, you know, she said, uh, you know, you might have something, you might want to look into this. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going back to school, get my degree. Um, at any rate, um, uh, a, a year later, it just kept sort of niggling at the, in the back of my mind. And when something sticks um, like that with me, generally speaking, I take it as a sign that perhaps I should investigate. And so I took a, a class um, that summer at Lee Strasberg in New York. And um, and a and had an experience, you know, in in the class that was very moving and really um, opened up, opened something up inside of me, um, and revealed to me that perhaps there was another place to put all of um, 
my experience and my expression, a place that would hold a bit more um, than maybe the written and then poetry would, because at the time I was written. The HBO poetry. series The Wire ran for five years. <clears throat> you starred in it. First of all, what does The Wire mean? Where did the name come from? Oh, well, we were, we essentially, we were, I mean, you'd have to ask, ask <laughs> David that, to be quite honest with you, but uh, just, I would say simply that, you know, we, the, we, were all, we were running a wiretap the entire five seasons on someone. <laughs> so um, the wire, you know, comes from that for sure. Um, I don't know if there's some sort of, you know, symbolic, you know, metaphorical sort of meaning that what was David your, was intending. What was your part? I played um, Detective Kima Greggs. She um, is, was just, she was known to be the, um, you know, the uh, yeah, I guess everybody just knows me as the, the lesbian cop. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I see her as, you know, more than, more than that. You know, I think in a certain way she was the moral compass of the police department. I, I thought, I, I think she held all of that. We have just a clip from a trailer. It doesn't show much, but mm -hmm. just so people who haven't seen it can get a, a flavor of it. That's what. Okay. No, 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 no. You see, I went to journalism school, all right? Northwestern. So y'all can't stay with me on this. Not even. No. no. You're right. talking just like you some crusty old reporter. I, I, well, excuse me? What? Bitch, you work at a TV station. Is this the same thing, all right? Mm. Look, come on. Stop talking. Here we go. Mm. Bring it. Monkey, monkey. Come on. Uh, uh, Y'all gotta work tomorrow. Oh, oh, candy ass. That's all I have to say. Mm. Oh. Mm. Mm. Okay. You see? Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm with you. All right. You look at Tanya. Uh. And she run a damn art gallery. <laughs> you see? What were we watching? What was that? That was actually um, one of my favorite scenes. Um, you uh, you get into the monologue just after that, where Kima um, talks about um, what um, moved her to become a cop and stay a cop, and and uh, the moment when her connection to the job was really sealed. Um, Cheryl, the woman who was um, speaking most of that clip, uh, was uh, played my. Uh, she, she was my. Um, my girlfriend um, in the show, um, and she was an attorney and did not like the fact that Kima was in law enforcement and really wanted me to wanted me to uh, she wanted me to uh, she wanted she wanted me to get out of the you know that line of work and so uh, it was a moment where we we really um, where uh, you realize that Kima's really connected to her job and her girlfriend realizes that she's very connected to the job and that it means more to her than she may um, realize. What impact it, 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 situated in Baltimore? I'm sorry, wait, wait a second. I just said that Cheryl was a was a, 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 a an attorney. No, she she played. Uh, you know, she worked at a, a television station. She wanted Kima to become an attorney. <laughs> That's what it was. She wanted Kima to study law. But this program was centered in Baltimore. Oh, absolutely, centered in Baltimore. Yes, at the harbor. A lot of it was around the harbor. Uh, actually, it, it, a lot of it did not take place uh, around the harbor. I saw some of season yeah, yeah. two. So season. I, oh, yeah. oh, oh, right, right, right. No, season two. Absolutely, the ports. You're right. You're absolutely. But, but right. let me just the characterize ports. it quickly, and you sure. you tell me how wrong I am. Okay. Lots of smoking. Lots of drinking. Lots of swearing. Lots of real world language. Mm -hmm. What I mean. What was the reaction that you got during these five years with this program? And when you say reaction from whom? Just the or? world. I mean, as oh. this is a. It seems okay. to me it was a rough. I mean, it showed you what I assume what mm -hmm. life is like up close and personal in that whole world up there. In mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I uh, there were there were there was certainly a population of people who could not watch the show. It was too raw and too real and um, and painful. Um, for them to see, uh, either because they came from that environment, um, or because um, you know the, some folks co uh, use television as, uh, as something to sort of uh, unwind with, and uh, um, 
so they, they didn't particularly care to um, spend their time um, in that world in that way. Um, however, a, a many, 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 many folks felt as though a story that's not been told truthfully, clearly, um, and without apology was being told. And I'm talking about uh, folks in law enforcement. Um, I'm talking about judges and attorneys, um, and politicians, uh, as well as folks um, whose lives were depicted by some of the, um, the street characters. Um, they felt as though uh, someone was finally getting it right. We grabbed some testimonies, how we uh, saw you for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, when you testified up in, I believe it was up in Baltimore, between, uh, the Attorney General's National mm -hmm. Task Force on uh, children exposed to violence. Mm -hmm. Let's just watch and then we can catch up with your story. Okay. I remember lying in bed on alert late one night as I heard an argument brewing in my parents' bedroom, only to be shocked by the deafening sound of my mother's jaw being crushed. I remember watching in horror as my mother's head lay on the chopping block of our kitchen counter while my father held a large butcher's knife to her throat as she cried and begged to be put out of her misery. My mother used to tell a story of how I stopped an argument between her and my father when I was a toddler by telling my father to stop it. Don't make my mommy cry. I was two years old. That incident kicked off a pattern of my believing that I had some control over and some responsibility for the situation. How hard was it for you to do that? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's been many years and a long process of healing. So I would say at this point in my life, you know, I'm, there is, there is some distance from the, from the, you know, the emotion and the sort of trauma of all that. Um, so now it, um, it's a part of my story, but it's not me. Um, so it was, I, I wouldn't say it was um, difficult for me to tell the story. Um, I think really it, it's, um, you know, I want to, I think what was most difficult for me, if, if we can call it difficult or challenging for me, was just, you know, you know my father's still living and we have a great relationship. Um, you know, members of my family are, are, you know, still a part of my life. And so I, I was just concerned um, as to how it would reflect upon them and how they would, um, how they would you know, take it. Uh, so, you know, just trying to navigate, you know, those waters of being respectful and honorable um, um, and, 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 and to, you know, honor their journey. Yeah. Born in Newport News, Virginia? Yes. No, 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 not born in Newport News, Virginia. I born was born in, in Georgia. In Georgia. Fort Benning. Father, African American, mother, Korean. Mm -hmm. What's what's that impact on your life? Having those two backgrounds. Well, I tell you, you know, growing up, at times it was a difficult. I grew up in um, in an all um, black neighborhood, um, and uh, you know, just in general, I think you know, with kids, you know, you don't want to stick out or be different, you know. Um, but particularly, you know, um, growing up, you know, in the South. Um, and newly desegregated South, um, uh, newly desegregated. Um, busing had just started when I was in elementary school, and Virginia was sort of one of the last states on that <laughs> on that track. So, um, um, you know, uh, it uh, you know there was a sort of challenge there. I'm always having to, um, uh, or many times, you know, having to. Um, sort of, you know, feeling as though I had to prove that um, I was, you know, as black, whatever that means, as the rest of my, you know, peers. And later on in life, I began to see that, you know, my, my definition of perception of blackness at the time was quite skewed. You know, it really was, you know, if you were tough and you could um, kick butt, then you were respected and that became, that was sort of a part of the running definition of blackness at the time. Um, uh, so, you know, there was that sort of challenge. However, I, I'm, I'm, I believe that it has, you know, being, you know, growing up a mixed race person, um, I think has had its advantages. Um, for me, in terms of how it's shaped my worldview and my perception, um, 
I, I, I was always very aware that, you know, I'm a person first as opposed to, um, you know, a label and, a, and an amalgamation of, you know, what people can see in terms of my mother and my father, that I'm a female or what have you. Um, and so um, there was always this strong um, impulse to unite and get folks to understand that, that we are, that I'm just a person, you know, and that we are all people. At this hearing, first. you talked about your father. Mm -hmm. My father was mentally ill. I later found out that he was paranoid schizophrenic. He was on lots of medication. Um, my father is a brilliant man. He had moments of brilliance as a parent. My father, you know, there were phases in our life where we tried to have Sunday dinner. Now, it might have been a tyrannical, um, nightmarish affair at times, but there were times when there was laughter at the table. My father thought he should teach us all how to play chess. By the time you were six, you knew how to play chess. Um, he had these moments of brilliance, but he had these, there came a time when he just turned into a monster, and I could no longer justify loving him. We also learned that your mother died some time ago? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When was that? My mother died in uh, 98. Again, when you go back in your own life, you grew up in, in Newport News, um, you talk about you were into the drugs mm -hmm. at some point. How did that happen in your life? What, what, how old were you and why, did you, why were you attracted to them? Wow. Um, you know, um, <laughs> well, I guess the story sort of speaks for itself, you know, after a while <laughs> it becomes, uh, you know, reality is a bit t tough to take. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, um, I started smoking pot when I was 11. Um, and at the time it wasn't as though I was doing it, um, as I, I wasn't conscious that I was doing it as an escape. Um, it was 11, an 11 year old in the neighborhood with other 11 and 12 year olds um, experimenting, you know, with pot. Um, but um, by the time I was 13, I was smoking every day. Um, and uh, again, you know, at that time, you know, you're not aware that um, you're doing it, you know, to sort of, you know, just keep things manageable or, you know, create some distance between you and what's really, um, what's really um, bothering you inside. Uh, and I, I would also say that around that time was about the time that I pretty much gave up on fixing my family. I was just trying to bide my time. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood, you know, many childhood hours trying to figure out how I could fix this situation. Um, and uh, around that, sometime between, between like 11 and 12 is when I just decided that um, there was nothing I could do about it, um, but I, I couldn't leave. And I had a whole plan to leave, and I, had, and I was confident that I could leave. I, uh, and I, needed, I wanted to leave town. It wasn't, I didn't want to go to a foster family or anything like that. I wanted to go to New York and be on my own and start my own life. And it's kind of you know, strange, I'm sure, for people to hear that an 11-year-old is you know, making this plan. And I had, you know, um, but um, I was literally you know, about to walk out the door, you know, had, had bag packed everything. And um, I just kept seeing, you know, just sort of like in a way visions, I guess, that of my mother just heartbroken and crying and feeling as though she had failed. Because I knew that my mother stayed in this marriage because she believed that we needed a father. And there was nothing I could do to convince her that regardless, that perhaps this was not the arrangement. <laughs> you know, we could have a father, but maybe not living in this arrangement. Um, but but my, mother, my mother grew up without a father. And I, you know, realized that that had a lot to do with, um, um, you know, her, her, you know, being adamant that we needed to keep our father, you know, in the home. Where, where had they met, by the way? They met in Korea. During the Korean War or after um, that? Uh, just after, I believe. It was just after the war when, when they met. Yeah. How did your mother do in this society? My mother was quite successful, um, you know, considering where um, 
she, uh, considering where she came from, um, my mother had maybe, and even in Korea, I think my mother had maybe a, uh, a sixth or seventh, seventh grade education. She, um, she um, could speak English. Um, but um, reading and writing was a challenge for her. Um, there were t you know, there was a point when we were um, you know growing up that she started taking um, classes at a local church. Um, but my mother was um, very gifted, uh, very gifted, not simply just a seamstress, but she could just make anything from scratch. Um, and, uh, you know, she um, spent most of her, of her life working um, for the government in a civil service capacity um, as an upholsterer um, down in Virginia on the various bases down there. And she um, rose to the rank of a supervisor in a shop down in the Norfolk Naval Base. Um, she always had a dream to build her own home. You know, we, we grew up in a um, mixed income housing unit. And, uh, you know, I saw my mother um, buy her first home home when I was um, a senior in high school uh, and then uh, within the, I guess uh, 10 years my mother had bought, my mother bought a piece of property out in Gloucester Virginia and had her brick house built and uh, on an acre and a half of land um, she was quite successful did you move from marijuana to cocaine well I mean not like that. <laughs> no, but I mean, but, one yeah. thing lead to another. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, you know, in, in junior high school, you know, it was, you know, um, speed and acid and marijuana. And then in late, I, later years of high school is when I first um, became introduced, when I first, when I was first introduced to cocaine. And that, um, and then, um, you know, that was pretty much, you know. What, what I really wanted to know was, you know, a lot of people are, use the drugs and we all wring our hands and say it's horrible, but mm -hmm. don't, do people enjoy these drugs? Is that why they're using them, or are you hiding from something? No, you enjoy, you enjoy them. While you, it, it, there comes a point when you no longer enjoy them. You know, but initially, um, there has to be some sort of enjoyment for you to, you know, you, uh, you know for instance, when I was um, 10 years old, I smoked my first cigarette. Uh, you know, cigarettes were 50 cents a pack. I put a quarter in the pack. So for me, I owned the pack. I took one hit off a cigarette and got so dizzy and fell on, you know, someone's bed. And I just, you know, I didn't care about the peer pressure. I didn't care that they were teasing me. I just said, you know what, I'm not smoking you can have them and I got teased and I didn't care and I never really smoked you know a cigarette again I mean you know occasionally socially I have you know in the future but you know I, I didn't touch I didn't enjoy it but when it came to pot um, pot in particular I enjoyed it, it was relaxing you know it, it it just you know for me it just it, it calmed my nerves it got me out of my head it, it, you know that's what what the initial attraction to that was um, you know drinking was never something um, that I really took to um, it was something that um, you know you know eventually you know when I when I got into cocaine drinking was something that became a little bit of a balance for the edge that the, the coke would give in the years that I started to not like it and I started to see where it was taking me um, but um, how'd you get out of it um, I got out of it you know initially you know through you know a therapist through meeting a therapist um, my um, first husband um, um, saw that there was a problem. Um, we were having problems and saw that there was, there was a problem and suggested that we go to therapy. And uh, this was the first time I'd ever tried therapy and I, I went to therapy with him. And uh, after our first session, she, you know, she essentially said, listen, you guys don't, you guys need individual therapy before we even touch couples. Well, I'll see you separately. And when I came back to see her, she, um, she completely pulled my card and no one had ever been able to pull my car. No one. They, I had written for three years in my journal that I was not living up to my t potential. That you know, no disrespect to housewives, but that I knew that I was. I should be doing more than just um, kind of you know raising my kids. And you know, I had a great life. You know, we had a middle class you know lifestyle. I was a good mom. Living where? Uh, living. This was in New York, Brooklyn at the time. Um, you know, the pic I, I had become very adept at creating a beautiful picture. This is something I learned, you know, when I was biding my time in junior high school, you know, and I said, okay, I've got to be here. I can't leave my mom. Um, 
this is a miserable situation. They're miserable. I can't save them from their misery, but I'm going to be happy. And I picked up drugs and started to create this sort of happy picture for myself, something that was tolerable for me to live in. That's when I became very active in sports. And for a while, I did very well in school. I was in the Junior Honor Society. I was a cheerleader. I mean, I did all kinds of things. And there were a lot of cool, fun people who were doing those things. And we were, you know, we created, you know, a, a scenario um, in which um, there was some level of comfort and, and we and we presented this picture to the world um, that you know allowed us to function and to earn money have jobs and whatnot you know and in a way this is sort of tied into I think sort of like you know the dual sort of existence that I think many African Americans live you know in this country you know you there is a face you know that you know you have to show um, you know, um, when you're trying to get, you know, you know, certain things accomplished or X, Y, and Z, but then there is sort of, you know, the down home side and the, you know, the, the, cult, the, the part of the culture that you can share with each other that you can't really share with the, with, um, the, the larger world because there's some judgment attached to that. So this, um, I believe that this fed into the kind of picture that I was able to create, you know, in my 20s, in my in my first marriage, and you, it all ended up. Yeah, happening. I'll come back to that, but sure. you, t you talked about this when you testified. Let's watch oh, this okay. segment of it. Mm -hmm. When you live in a world that is never safe, where you feel abandoned and uncared for, numbing the pain and finding some kind of support becomes an essential survival skill. This is how I became and how many children today become easy prey for pedophiles. This is why our young people create the nurturance they so desperately need by forming and joining gangs. This is why many children enter into the drug world at an early age. This is why the sex trade begins to seem like a viable option, and this is how we lose our nation's future. Without resources to deal with trauma, numbing your pain with drugs and sex, or creating an illusion of family by seeking support on the streets become your coping mechanisms. You will take what is given easily and freely. Oftentimes, these children end up in a pattern of using these self-destructive acts to escape the smallest of discomforts, never gaining the proper ability to handle simple stresses of everyday life. They end up having sex as a way to find emotional support and may become very young parents. The effects of the violence they live with just add up in layers, burying them. Why did you agree to testify? Um, because I, I actually, I, I believe in the mission of the task force, um, that, um, I believe that the fabric of our nation is being, um, is disintegrating and, and being ripped apart, um, at the seams, uh, because our, we're not paying enough attention, attention to the, the trauma and the pain and the struggles um, that our young people are facing today. Uh, How old are your kids? Oh, my children are, are older. I have a 21-year-old and a 25-year-old. Boys or girls? Girls. That's by your first marriage? Yes. Did you marry again? I did. Any children no. by the second marriage? No. By the way, what, are, what kind of uh, work are your daughters in? My youngest daughter is graduating from California Institute for the Arts this year. She's a theater major. <laughs> She's about to follow that path. Um, my older daughter is, uh, she's been working in retail for the last few years and I'm interested in fashion and right now that's, she has her sights set, you know, in that direction. And you live where now? I live, I'm, I'm telling everyone, I live where I work, essentially. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in Baltimore. When I'm working um, on Body of Proof, I'm in L.A. That's the ABC That's show? That's the ABC show that I'm a part of right now. Uh, and when that show is down, I come back to the East Coast, and I spend um, you know, a, a, a part of my time in Baltimore. Uh, because uh, Rewire for Change, the nonprofit that I run, is based in Baltimore. And uh, I have a home in uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which used to be a vacation home. Now it's basically my <laughs> primary residence. Um, and then I have connections in New York, family and friends. My, my oldest daughter is in New York. So I pretty much kind of hop between those three places. But I'm using North Carolina as my, my primary residence right now. But the main reason to ask you to come here is to talk about the impact of wi the wire on you and the organization that you mm -hmm. formed. What's it called again? Rewired for Change. When did you start it? Uh, the seed 
I guess the vision came to me in 2008, and then 2009 is when we officially started, and that's when we, um, our, we got our 501c3 in 2009. What's it do? Well, Rewire for Change, um, we, you know, it's essentially our mission is to, um, to support, and empower, and affect the lives of high-risk youth and their families and the communities in which they live. Uh, we started by um, offering a, um, our pilot program, Rewired for Life, um, which is a program that was um, geared to high-risk young people who had been arrested before, and we used um, the wire as a, as a the, the wire of the show as a springboard for discussion and, uh, and to um, awaken them to the possibilities um, of personal transformation. How did you raise the money? Oh gosh, <laughs> how am I raising the money? <laughs> you know, initially, you know, re really the, the organization, you know, I, it was my money that I used for um, the organization. You know, we're, th I mean, that's still something that's ongoing right now, you know. How many people are working there now? Um, right now we have, we, for the last uh, year and a half, we have been, gosh, it's been two years, 2010, yeah, year, for the last year and a half, we've been running a, um, we've been, um, running a, um, a community home um, in Baltimore called the Village House. And, you know, at the Village House, um, we offer an after-school program, um, and we uh, sponsor a local community group called the Village Council, um, and essentially open our doors to the, the, to the community and to be supports for them in any way that we can. Um, that house right now um, employs uh, four, four, four people. How many? Uh, you, how? What's the age group that you'll take into the house? Um, well, through the through the uh, through the after school program, um, we're talking about seven to um, middle school. So I, I think what we have now is about seven to thirteen. Um, and then we were running our Rewire for Life program out of there, but right now our Rewire for Life program is down because we're revamping the curriculum and we're going to reintroduce it. It's been, it, that was a two-year pilot and we learned a lot and now we're actually revamping the curriculum and, and putting out the official Rewire for Life program later this year. So that's down. Um, and then, you know, and, the, and then the community. One of the things that we, we um, discovered um, after uh, after offering the Rewired for Life pilot program. By the way, what is the difference between uh, Rewired for Life and then you have the... Oh, Rewired for Change is the name of the organization. Yeah. Rewired for Life is the program for high-risk young people. Okay. okay. The Village Council is the local community group that's sponsored by, um, by the Village House. And the Village House is an in initiative of Rewired for Change. Um, one of the things we 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 discovered when um, through um, uh, our work with the pilot program was that if our young people had to go back to families and communities that were broken and not unified and not um, and not healthy, then it made their um, it would make their transformation much more challenging and that there was no way to sort of isolate a population and truly help and truly assist them to the to be um, truly we're looking at we're looking for real healing we're not looking for okay you get your GED you get a job then you're set you're off the streets that means something to us but what has unfolded is that what, what we want to see is a deep level of healing in the life of a young person, but also in the lives of the entire community. And so our overall mission really is to uplift and empower communities of folks, to, re, re, to recreate community in a way that we have not seen in um, underserved communities since I was young in the 70s. Statistics. Uh, I just saw this in the paper the other day. 80% mm -hmm. of African Americans don't qualify to be in the military. That was the headline. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, 70% of white people, uh, men don't qualify and women to go in the military. And I don't know the, I mean, it's, huh. it's a rather large statistic because mm -hmm. of being obese and all the other things, the mm -hmm. drugs and all that. And then the statistic that I know you're aware of that roughly 40% of the American people have children out of wedlock, 70% mm -hmm. of the black community has children out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. how, how did this happen to us? And how do you get out of it? 
You know, that's a big question, Brian. <laughs> I thought it was small. <laughs> you know, I, you know, that's a big question. I mean, and, and how do we, you know, I mean, I have certainly can have an opinion about it. I'm, I'm no one's authority on those issues for sure. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think this boils down to something really simple, but, um, that, you know, it, I, you know, you say 70, um, percent, you know, I, I actually was not familiar with that, um, with that statistic. 70% of African Americans have children out of wedlock. Um, now I'd like to know how that's broken down within age groups. I think that um, would inform, you know, my answer. Um, I think a lot of them are young brothers. Younger. Yeah. You know, well, I talked about it, you know, in, in the clip, you know, where, you know, we all, you know, I, I, the deepest need, I believe, of every human being is to be loved. I mean, that's a, that's a core need, you know. That's something that, you know, as an actor, you know, you've got to know <laughs> that, you know, any character, but somewhere in there, you know, is a need to be loved. And um, when you don't get that nurturance and that, you know, not to say that children who are involved in that kind of behavior aren't loved, but, you know, to love in a healthy way um, entails a lot more than, you know, being cared for in sort of basic ways. You know, it, it, it calls for, you know, an emotional, you know, nurturance. It calls for, um, it, it calls for guidance. It calls for, you know, a whole host of, you know, other um, uh, you know, aspects that, um, that, you know, uh, a young person needs to grow up healthily. And when you don't have those things, you know, you reach out any way you can to feel that. And, uh, and sometimes it's just touching and, you know, and then one thing leads to another and you become invested in a, you know, you start to, you become invested, you know, um, in another person in an unhealthy way. You know, things that, that, you know, by the time you're in your late teens or early 20s, things that a healthy young person, a person who's been nurtured um, properly, fully and wholly, um, you know, they're at the point now where they can, they can self-nurture, where they can go inside and there's confidence and there's their, their principles and their values and their things that they can hold on to and anchor themselves to. They don't have to anchor themselves to another person, attach themselves and enmesh themselves with someone else to give them what they, you know, are lacking inside. Um, and I believe that, you know, that pattern has a lot to do with that st statistic. Going back again in your life, you, we have some testimony here where you decided to do something to your father. It's rather strong stuff. Let's mm -hmm. watch that and then ask you to explain it. I spent weeks figuring, trying to figure out how to get my hands on a gun, but I had no success. So I resorted to a new option after reading in a magazine how a popular R&B singer of the day had been scalded by a hot pot, pot of grits. My last attempt to save myself and the family came one day when I was washing dishes. I washed myself calmly, take the biggest pot we had, fill it with water, put it on the stove to boil, and went back to doing the dishes. I now know that when I began to watch myself as though I were outside of my body, I had disassociated. Once the water boiled, I took the pot, and I walked slowly into the living room, and I stood over my father as he slept on the sofa. All the scenes of violence I had witnessed flashed before my mind's eye. And then I saw us without him. I saw myself happy and free in my home. I saw laughter on the faces of the rest of my family. I stepped closer to the sofa. Just as I was about to throw the water on him, a horrifying thought suddenly jolted me to consciousness. The singer did not die. This pot of water was not going to kill my father. Suddenly the pot seemed to shrink in my hands, and so did I. I began to see myself as this tiny child I was. A wave of grief and sadness rushed, rushed over me. I stood there growing smaller and smaller until I felt completely insignificant and totally useless. Have you ever talked to your dad about that? I've never spoken to my father about that. Really? Yeah. My father he is a different man now. And I really want to make that clear, you know, regardless of, you know, the various, you know, diagnoses and, you know, problems he had, um, you know, when we were younger. You know, he had a bad 20 years, <laughs> you know, but he's 80 now. Um, um, did he see that? Um, no, he didn't. I don't think he's seen that. Um, we, but I have, I have spoken to my father about the past and I have tried to, you know, gingerly 
kind of prepare him and you know um, speak to him about some of the things that are that's that are you know being revealed right now um, but you know he has shared with me that he would rather not go back and revisit you know that time in his life and that um, he's a changed man and um, and he and he'd like to sort of keep his focus on you know where he is now and I need to respect that and um, and that's why it's, it's it's always a little uncomfortable when I see this you know I see this stuff coming out in the public because you know I, I care about my father very deeply and um, I, I want to make sure that folks understand that a life is very long, that redemption and transformation is possible. It happened in my life, it happened in the life of my father, and my family is not the family that I grew up in anymore. It is a different family. But when we read about your life, for instance, you were molested by your babysitter, mm -hmm. what impact did that have on you? Oh, that, would, that had a grave impact on me. Um, I, I think that was probably one of the, um, you know, that was that was um, the probably the most challenging the 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 the, the, the sort of wreckage of that abuse um, was the most challenging for me to get through because for it, it took me decades to really understand that I was a victim um, because as a I thought that there was a relationship. And it was a really, you know, I was a, I was, you know, this is pr probably from the ages of four to nine. Um, and, and what was most difficult for me at the time was a sense of betrayal and abandonment because when this babysitter left the, left the neighborhood, she said she was coming back and she would visit me and see me. And what was most devastating to me was that she never came back. And so um, um, that, you know, as you can imagine, you know, informed, you know, my intimate relationships, you know, moving forward and, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, you know, is, you know, played into, you know, a lot of my own sort of relationship dysfunction. Um, and that was followed by, a, you know, in years later as a teenager, I was also, you know, I, 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 um, I was raped as a teenager and, and that was, you know, all of that sort of tangled up and, you know, those are quite a few knots. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. The reason I bring it all up is because you've obviously lived all these things and you're mm -hmm. now working with young people. Mm -hmm. Did they have a chance? I mean, what would you advise them knowing what you've lived through? And now if you look back on your life, mm -hmm. what would you have done differently to get out of that situation? Or would you? I did the best I could in the, with the, you know dealing with the circumstances um, um, you know within those circumstances I definitely I did the best that I could at the time um, so I wouldn't say there was something I would do differently um, you know there were things that had shaped my mind to make the kind of decisions that I, I was making I was you know incredibly bright um, I you know but because I didn't Somewhere inside, despite all the sort of accomplishments and the picture that I created in high school, um, you know, active in sports and, um, um, you know, basically had a B average, you know, ba I wasn't studying. You know, I could make a, you know, I could have a B average without studying and getting high every day and working. Um, and, you know, in all those activities, um, I had decided not to, you know, I was a straight A student pretty much in elementary school, but I decided that, you know, what was all that work for? Um, you know, it, it, if I wasn't, if I couldn't be happy. Um, and so, um, you know, I believe if I'd had a mentor in high school, I think I looked like the kid that was going to be fine. So no one really no one thought that I needed, you know, a mentor of, of any sort. She's going to be fine. And, and they were right, essentially. But I believe that, you know, if I had a mentor who could see beneath um, the surface, that, you know, I would have gone on to, um, I, was, I absolutely would have, you know, finished college. I probably would have gone to, you know, an Ivy League type school. And, you know, because there was this sort of idea that Sonia would be a lawyer or, or, or something uh, down the down the line. But I threw that away um, when I gave up on, when when, ha when happiness really was, was my, what I was striving for. But getting back to the, the what I would say to young people, um, in these situations, I'll tell you what really led me, um, got me to the light, you know, brought me to where I am today. Because if it can happen for me, 
It can happen for every single young person who is struggling with the issues that I was struggling with and even worse. I have, I, I have friends who have stories like mine um, who have, you know, who have, um, who are successful now, um, personally and professionally. Um, and the thing that I think we all have in common is that we were, that unbeknownst to ourselves, we listened and nurtured the, we, we nurtured the ability to listen to our inner voice. You know, there is an inner voice and an intuition, if you want to call it that, um, that I strongly believe is connected to something much greater than myself and other people. And it is knowing when to move, when to fall back, you know, when to jump off a cliff, even though it looks as though you're not going to make it. Um, because that voice will never fail you. Getting to know that inner voice and following it in every instance that you can. Um, you know, this is the thing that I see um, that folks who come from that background who find success um, have, um, it's a muscle that they have um, trained and nurtured and that is very strong within them. And that's something that, you know, that's, that's what, you know, we'd like to teach and like to, you know, you know, in the pro, in the Rewire for Life program, what we'd like to give these young people. Do kids have any, two girls have any trouble like you had? My oldest daughter probably had the most challenges um, because she, when she was born, I was still using. Um, I, um, I, I changed my, I did my sort of one, my 180 in my life um, when she was about um, four or five years old. And then, you know, those early years, you know, when you, after you've done the 180, everything doesn't just clear up. I mean, that's, then the, you're putting in all that hard work and while you're processing and going through and all this stuff is being drummed up, you know, and you've got to raise kids, um, you know, and, and be, you know, in a marriage and you've created a bit of a mess there. And, you know, there's, it's, it's a messy process. And so, you know, the people around you get splattered with some of that and it's, you know, which is, you know, unfortunate, but it's a part of the process. And, uh, and I did it for myself, but I did it, I was inspired, I really moved to do it, you know, for my children because I saw what I was creating in, in the home. I saw that I was becoming that, the, the, the type of entity that my father had become in our home and that it was affecting my older daughter. So my older daughter has had to you know work through I think um, quite a few more challenges than my younger daughter my younger daughter was was born just before I turned around so she has seen you know the best of me um, whereas my oldest daughter definitely was affected by do you talk to so. them about this absolutely we're quite honest we they I'm, I probably talk too much <laughs> in the past I think I've probably spoken too much with them about it but but I think in the end we we're very transparent as I was going through my process as I was healing you know you know if if you know there you know if I was not not um you know, if I was having a rough time, you know, with the girl, you know, in the home and you could see it and I knew what was happening, you know, I would share it with them and say, listen, mommy's having a rough time here and some of the things. And as they became older, I would, I would, I would be able to, you know, I was able to share more and more of my story with them so that they could understand so that they, because I wanted them to be able to do, to, to, to take that journey. Um, you know, I think every person, regardless of, you know, how you grew up, you, there's some sort of journey that you have to take in terms of getting to know yourself and, um, and I wanted them. I wanted them to know that that's important in life. That 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 is that is a part of of, of, of living a full a whole life. One of the rehabilitation clinics in this country. I remember a statistic coming from them that 83 percent of the people that go into rehab don't turn it around. Mm. That means that 17 percent do, and that's drugs and alcohol. Um, what do you think of those statistics? And how did you? Did you go through <clears throat> uh, detox, or did you go through any kind of a of a twenty eight day program, or did you just do it on no, your own? No, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't go through um, a, a program um, like that. Um, you know, I had a really supportive husband at the time. 
um, and um, we could afford therapy and uh, I was in therapy and um, I you know for some years I did um, get you know the help of an outside support group um, and I and and to be quite honest with you you know within that support group you know I, all I saw around me was successful uh, lives you know a, a great number of people successfully turning their lives around so those numbers um, I you know, I, I you know I, I can't you know, I, I certainly, you know, I can't refute or validate, you know, well, but. Go, go to this, I also, they did a, an article on you in the Washington Post Magazine, mm -hmm. and I, I wrote down some words. Okay. Uh, thugging it up, what's that mean? <laughs> Just <laughs> criminal behavior, you know, robbing, stealing, fighting, you know. Yeah, well that's, those are the other words, selling drugs, partying, yeah. stealing, robbing and all. Uh, how much of that goes on, inner city, or not just inner city. I mean, you. Yeah, the I drug, think it, the drug now, thing. It's, now it's happening in, in the suburbs. Drug and it's thing not just, is all over the place. No, absolutely. You know, how much of it goes on? I, you know, I, I, a great deal of it goes on. It just depends on, you know, the community that you live in. But I believe even in the communities where you can't see it, it's happening. Um, um, you know, again, this is this is what I believe is tearing, you know, you know, this, you know, this country apart. You know, the, you know, what we what we refuse to see, what we think is none of our business because it's uncomfortable to 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 deal with until someone in our family is affected. Um, and, um, um, you know, we, you know, you know, if we don't, you know, if we don't collectively address, um, you know, some of the, you know, shadows and, and you know, the the, the dark, um, you know, what's 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 it's no longer hiding in the dark corners of the recesses of society. It's out in broad daylight now. If we don't address, you know, and address this, you know, full on, um, it's just going to, you know. A, you know, continue to, to, tear, to tear the country apart. At the end of uh, 2011, you made a speech out in Los Angeles, and I want to show you what you look like. Oh my goodness, what, was, what is this? <laughs> but I know the population that I'm working with on the streets of Baltimore who don't believe that anything can be different. They don't believe anything can be different in their families. They don't believe that there's anything, you know, bigger than the four square blocks that they live in. They believe that's just the reality that is. So, you know, what, what, what I want to, you know, pose to some of you folks is maybe changing the language a little bit and maybe creating a new model, maybe kind of like healing from a whole other dimension. One, from, one that leaves, that, that takes us out of this, this position of being victims of the government and victims of everything that has happened to us. Because see, that shit's going to go on forever, as long as they're human beings, okay? It's, that's just the nature of man. All right, so what can we do to operate from the now and to say healing is our focus? And I'm particularly talking to the people who are, who are reaching folks on the streets and saying, listen guys, if you want things to change in your life, you want things to change in your family, you want something to be different in your community, then you've go you're gonna have to be a part of this change. Why, why are you doing this? Because it's who I am. I just it's 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 uh, it's my life's mission. All my life, I've been, I've known I was born to for some purpose. This is what's coming through, and um, I'm simply trying to honor that. I'm simply just trying to honor what's true for me. So I'm a kid now. I'm about. To 13 years old, and I'm doing what you used to do. I'm smoking pot or maybe move to speed or cocaine or whenever you do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm robbing and stealing and all that stuff. Am I robbing and stealing, by the way, to get money to buy the stuff? Is that why I'm doing that? Oh my gosh, Rob, a lot of these young people are robbing and stealing so they have food, so okay. they have clothing. But, but how do you get the money for the drugs, by the way? How did you get it in, in your day? I sold, you know, I worked. I worked and I sold drugs. My brother was a, um, was a drug dealer in the neighborhood. and Your so, brother was killed? Yes. How? When? He was uh, murdered in uh, North Carolina in 1988. Because? What were the circumstances? 
Oddly enough, my brother was down there trying to make a change. He had moved from Virginia to North Carolina. Uh, my father was down there, and he was really trying to trying to trying to make a change. And uh, he had um, he was living in my uncle's home, and next door was a young woman who uh, who had an abusive boyfriend. And from time to time, he would talk to her. And um, the boyfriend. Um, I basically was jealous and told him to stay away from his girlfriend. And my brother w wasn't going after the woman, he was just befriending her and speaking with her. And uh, eventually he killed him because of that. I started to ask you, I, you know, yeah. I'm a 13, 14 year old, what would uh -huh. you tell me and what do you interact with these kids at the University of Maryland where this is, or up in Baltimore where you're doing this? Well, when we were when program. we were running the pilot program, I was I was you know I was a part of the facilitation team because it was important for me to see what was working and what wasn't working, um, but also because I I have such a passion for young people and I um, particularly young people who are caught up in you know those cycles, and um, and um, and such a desire um, to see them transform and overcome. Um, it's, you know, that work I love. I love doing that work so much. However, I just don't have the capacity, you know, in terms of time, resources, and, and just, um, um, you know, they're there. And I've, you know, in this line of work, I've, I've seen a lot of folks who've been very well trained to do that kind of work, and it's been better for me to sort of empower them to do that work. Um, but, um, you know, it's very, you know, preaching, preaching to these kids and talking at them is not the way that they're going to make that shift. The shift is experiential. It's something that has to happen internally. And so, you know, the gift of being able, you know, the gift of those who know how to um, guide those young people, you know, uh, you know, through that transformation is, you know, this gift of knowing, you know, you know, when to fall back and allow them to express themselves and sort of make the mistakes that they need to make without condemning them and without abandoning them and um, always un knowing that, that you're, you're there to support them regardless because it's unconditional love that these young people need to, need, to, need to connect to on a very deep level. That I'm not bad, there's nothing wrong with me, that no matter what I do, that I'm still, I'm, I'm still worthy. That's one piece and then there's Finding the curriculum that will that allow that give the, I think a really I think a really good curriculum allows these young people to explore themselves to get to know themselves and explore a lot of issues and, and, and raises awareness about things that they may not know about but at the same time understand that they have that what they have inside their thoughts their feelings their opinions their experiences are very valid and very valuable. Five years of The Wire on HBO. Mm -hmm. You can buy it in the stores. You can watch it on demand, some of the episodes. But if they want to, if our audience wants to see you today, what time, what day, what's your character, and then I'll let you go. Well, you can see me these days on ABC, um, ABC's Body of Proof. That's Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock. I play Detective Samantha Baker. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a homicide detective, and we, my partner, uh, Bud, uh, who's played by John Carroll Lynch, um, we are the sort of support team for the medical examiner's office, and the medical examiner in particular is Megan Hunt, who's played by Dana Delaney. Sonia Sohn, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.